Good evening and welcome to the Alumni Spotlight Series presentation of the Eastern Kentucky University Office for Alumni Engagement. My name is Dan McBride. I'm the Associate Vice President for Development and Alumni Engagement at EKU and we welcome you to our first Alumni Spotlight Series show of the year 2022. We've been on hiatus for a few months but we are coming back tonight and we're coming back with a bang as a, a part of Scholars Week at, here at EKU. Tonight's presentation will feature one of our scholars um, who is an EKU alum and has been around uh, the world, literally, uh, doing research and creating some great visuals that you're going to get to see tonight. I'm very excited about that. Uh, but before we get to tonight's guests, uh, a couple of things we do want to mention and promote, uh, let you know that Scholars Week continues throughout the next actually week and a half, week to 10 days. Uh, there are a lot of different Scholars Week activities that are going to be happening. We are kind of kicking the week off yesterday and tonight, and uh, we hope that uh, you'll participate and take part in some of the other events that will be happening during Scholars Week. The information on where you can get the entire schedule is on the screen there, ekuscholars.eku.edu. Go there and check it out and see if some of the other events coming up might be of interest to you. We also want to let you know about EKU Giving Day, which is coming up on April 13th, just a little over a week away now, and uh, it is our annual giving day. This year, our goal is to reach 2,022 donors in a 24-hour period, and we hope that you will join us and participate. Again, it's not about the amount of money raised or amount of money that you give. It's about the participation, trying to generate 2,022 givers in 2022, and even if you give a dollar to $10 to $1,000, whatever you can do to help us on that day, we hope that you will join us for Giving Day 2022, and we will be doing some live uh, reports from the campus on that day. It's going to be a lot of fun. We have challenge gifts. We have prizes that you can win. A whole lot of things going to be going on Giving Day coming up on April 13th. But again, for tonight, it's a rainy day on the EKU campus. Hopefully, wherever you are, you've got a little more sunshine or blue skies. And tonight, we are going to be talking to someone who is in what is usually the sunny state of Florida, but we're not exactly sure if he's got sunshine tonight. I know there's rain all across the southern part of the U.S. Our guest tonight is uh, someone who received their B.A. in geology at EKU in 2006. He currently serves as an associate professor of geology at South Florida University. But as our discussion goes on tonight, you'll find that associate uh, professor is just one of many hats that our guest wears. We are very pleased tonight to have with us Dr. Jason Gully. Jason, welcome to the Alumni Spotlight Series. Hey, Dan, thanks for having me. It's been uh, pretty sunny here in Florida today. Um, got a little early dose of summer, so uh, yeah, well, it's nice to have it cool off in the evening. We are very jealous uh, because it's been raining all day in Richmond. Uh, now, I mentioned that you're an associate professor of geology at South Florida, but um, I think you have a lot of titles. You're a, a glacial hydrologist. You are a writer, a photojournalist, a technical diving instructor, a National Geographic explorer. Um, you kind of are a jack of all trades. You've got a lot of different things you're into. Yeah, it's it's all kind of related to the research that I do in environments that most people never get to work in. So, you know, when I started working inside glacier caves and underwater caves, they're places that most people and, and very few scientists get to go into. So I spent a lot of time and effort trying to figure out how to photograph those places to make it accessible to people who can't go themselves. I know you have been to some of the most remote, remote parts of the world, Mount Everest. Um, you've been to Greenland, Alaska. You've done a lot of different stuff. Um, so obviously traveling is a busy part of your schedule, um, but you've got to see some pretty amazing places. Man, you know, every day uh, I get to go and work in one of those places, I realize how lucky I really am. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time and a lot of money going to, to places that the average person will never, ever get to go. And when I bring my students, you know, to Greenland and we're loading up on the helicopter and getting ready to fly out and set up a camp that can last for a month or two months at a time, I try to make sure everybody, you know, we've been really stressed out about uh, all the prep and everything, but I want everybody to realize that, you know, this is a part of the world that very, very few people will ever get to see and that they should feel fortunate that, um, you know, we have science funding in this country that allows us to do that. Yeah, you're a professor uh, at the university. Talk a little bit about your being able to balance uh, your teaching load with uh, also having the opportunity to go around and do some of this research that you've done. I don't know that I'm the best person to talk about balance, um, but, you know, we try to make it work. 
so, you know, I'm uh, a lot of my you know career, even starting at Eastern Kentucky University as a student, uh, I spent enormous amounts of time in the field. I was doing undergraduate research uh, in Nepal uh, when I was undergrad there, and I'd spend two months a year. Uh, you know, typically in November and December, and I had professors and administrators at EKU that worked really hard to make sure that I could do that uh, and still complete all of my assignments and, and graduate on time. Uh, you know, and that's something that's carried with me, uh, you know, as I've continued, you know, throughout, you know, graduate school and then also, uh, you know, my professional career as, as a professor. It's, you know, if I'm interviewing for a job or a graduate school position and, you know, it doesn't sound like that's going to be a real good fit, then, you know, maybe it's just not going to be a, a great fit. And at the University of South Florida, they've been really, um, they, they've been really helpful in allowing me to go out to the field and, and spend sometimes six, eight months a year in the field. And then what I do is I typically put almost all of my teaching load uh, into the spring semester. So um, I teach the same number of classes as everybody else in my department. I just teach them in half the year. <laughs> so my, my spring semester is usually really a lot of, a lot of teaching. So, but I, you know, I enjoy it too, because it's an opportunity. One of the classes that I'm teaching right now is scientific diving. Um, I take students who just learned how to scuba dive uh, and teach them how to do research and, and survive underwater. And that's an opportunity to take some of the skills that I've developed to work in, in different places and try to help pass those on to the next generation. Now, before you went to South Florida, and you mentioned it's been sunny there and you've had nice weather, but you spent a little time in Michigan where the weather was just the opposite at times. I did. My uh, my first faculty position after uh, so, uh, graduate school at the University of Florida, I did my PhD right after I finished at Eastern, and then I spent two years as a postdoc in Austin at the University of Texas. And my first faculty position, I spent two and a half years at Michigan Technological University, which is in the Keweenaw Peninsula on the Upper Peninsula. So, you know, it's about as far north as you can get uh, in the Great Lakes region. Uh, this tiny little spit of land that just gets hammered by lake effect snow. So on an average year, we get about 27 feet of snow every year. So I would use all that mountaineering equipment that I have for research to go up on the roof and shovel the roof off so that it wouldn't collapse at least once every winter. <laughs> so yeah, we don't, don't have a whole lot of that down here in Tampa. Yeah, you've had the opportunity to do uh, a lot of diving, I assume, now that you're in Florida. That there's a lot more diving opportunities there than uh, even what you had in Kentucky. Yeah, so, you know, when I was in Kentucky, I ended up in Kentucky. I originally started my undergrad at Purdue, uh, but I, I found that I was spending all my time in Kentucky caving. <laughs> and um, I was doing a lot of dry caving exploration, and then we were trying to continue exploring caves that would go underwater. So I learned how to cave dive and started dragging scuba tanks in through, you know, sections of dry caves, setting it up and, it, you know, started exploring in, in underwater tunnels. And I found that uh, a lot of times I just wasn't going back to Purdue and it wasn't particularly great for my grade point average. So I uh, ended up, ended up relocating to Kentucky and, but yeah, so, you know, cave diving in particular has been a big part of, of my life and, you know, scuba diving in general. I did a lot of scuba diving in the Great Lakes uh, when I was at Michigan Tech. We had five shipwrecks uh, between my house and the parking lot for the geology department. So, a lot of times I'd throw gear in the back of the truck and try to hit something on the way to or from work. Now, as you think back, uh, you, you started at Purdue, you came to Eastern, you think back on your time at Eastern, what are some things that you remember about your days as a Colonel? Man, you know, the, the geology department was, was really great uh, to me. It was, um, you know, it's one of the, the few places in, in, uh, in academia where you could still get like a classical geology education. So, you know, I, I work at a, um, you know, like a major research university now. And, you know, it's not to say that uh, we don't care about teaching, like we all care very much about teaching, but um, a lot of what we're hired to do is is research. Um, you know, whereas, you know, we had great professors at Eastern Kentucky University who spent a lot of time and effort trying to make sure that we were learning, um, you know, a, a classical like foundation for geology that I don't think that you get um, in a lot of places anymore. Um, so, you know, I had that going for me. I spent a lot of time caving. Uh, anytime I wasn't in the classroom, um, I was usually caving. Or uh, when I first started working inside glacier caves, I had to learn how to ice climb. So I'd leave class uh, on Friday, drive up to Canada, uh, spend Saturday and Sunday ice climbing in Canada, and then try to drive all the way back from Canada to be back in class on, on Monday. So those were always uh, always good trips uh, as well. Those are things that you can do as a college student, but maybe not uh, make those same kind of drives today <laughs> back and forth. It's <laughs> as you get older, I'm sure you're like me that that was a great idea when you were a college student, but maybe not so much today. 
Yeah, I don't. I honestly, I really don't know how I, I did it. I hate driving anymore. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, if driving 15 hours for the weekend seemed like a reasonable thing to do at the time. So. Yeah, one of the professors you had uh, at EKU is the professor that I had when I was here as well, Dr. Ralph Ewers. And I know you had said that he had a real impact and some of the things even that he was doing helped you in some of the research you're doing today. Yeah, so Dr. Ewers did like his dissertation research that he did for his PhD is really the foundation for all modern thinking in cave hydrology. Um, so, you know, winding up at a place like Eastern Kentucky University it was just a, a real amazing gift to the university. So what I was able to do is I was sitting in his class learning about how he helped understand how caves develop and change this older model uh, for cave development in limestone at the same time that I was starting to work on similar problems in glaciers. And I realized I was like, hey, wait a minute, like if I just did all the same stuff that Dr. Ewers did in limestone in glaciers, I'm pretty sure that we could get pretty far at understanding how water is flowing through glaciers. And that's exactly what I did. Um, so, you know, like I said, just, I don't know that I would have the career that I have now if I hadn't sat in a class uh, with Dr. Ewers and heard all about the stuff that he did, um, as a graduate student. Yeah. And obviously he was pretty entertaining in the classroom as well. He always kept it interesting. <laughs> he sure did. Yeah. We, we, we were, we were talking, uh, you know, earlier about how he'd climb up on the desk and, you know, read from the book and, you know, he was still doing that right up until the time that he retired. Yeah, he was, a, he was a good teacher and, and a lot of fun. Now, also, while you were at EKU, some of the, the things that you did and uh, some of the folks that you met, I think, also helped spur you into some of the glacier work that you're doing today. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, like especially uh, Dr. Ewers, um, you know, the work that he did, um, you know, was really foundational for me academically. And then, you know, like I said, there were a number of administrators and uh, professors at Eastern Kentucky that allowed me to be able to go and do field work. You know, it's not a super common problem for an undergraduate student to have where they're going out and trying to get grants to fund research uh, and then have to go out and do it. So, um, you know, I wasn't really the best uh, classroom student either. So I was a kind of a unique case, but um, I, you know, I, I was lucky to have professors and, and department chairs and administrators who saw that I had a drive to learn uh, and maybe it wasn't the most traditional way of learning and they worked with me to help me get to where I wanted to go. And like, that's something well, that you don't get everywhere. And, and you had the fortune of being close to uh, the gorge, which was a great place to go and, and climb and learn. And Yeah, absolutely. So I, um, yeah, I, I got into glacier caving as a total accident and I went rock climbing, you know, living real close to Red River Gorge. It's one of the top rock climbing destinations in the Eastern US. A uh, mutual friend uh, invited me on a rock climbing trip with a glaciologist from Scotland who was studying these, uh, how climate change was affecting glaciers in the Everest region, causing glaciers to melt and turn into these large, uh, unstable lakes that would drain catastrophically through the glacier, through caves. But nobody really understood how those caves were forming. So I got really excited. You know, we're climbing and, you know, hanging off a, you know, the side of a cliff, having this whole conversation about my background in caves and what he was seeing at Everest. And, you know, all I'm hearing is that there are these caves that nobody understands in glaciers on Everest and nobody had ever been in them. So I, I took him to a limestone cave the next day uh, near where I was living in Somerset at the time. And I showed him, I was like, look, you know, this is what we do in, in, in cave hydrology. This is what I've learned from, you know, Dr. Ewers. You know, we're going to go in, we're going to map out this cave. And by paying attention to how the shape of the passage changes from one place to another and its relationship to, you know, features in the walls or fractures, we can usually infer what was controlling the cave as it formed. I was like, if we go to Everest and we do this, like, I'm sure we can figure out how those caves form. Of course, you know, Dr. Doug Ben, the glaciologist that I was working with, when he tells the story, he's like, when we first started, uh, you know, the only thing that I knew, of, you know, the only thing that Doug knew about caves uh, was that they were dark. And the only thing that Jason knew about glaciers was that they were cold. You know, I'd never even <laughs> seen a glacier at that point in time in my life. So, um, yeah, it's, I don't know. Looking back on it in retrospect, I'm kind of su amazed that we survived any of the, the early trips because, I mean, we literally rocked up to the Everest region with no experience in glacier caving at all and managed to not die. Um, you know, we just took my background in caves and his background in mountaineering and glaciers. And anytime something really bad happened, we just sit around and you know do an audit and be like, hmm, well, we should probably remember everything that led up to that and, and not do that again. <laughs> 
Well, I know you've contributed to more than 100 different uh, research publications. You've been featured in National Geographic and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal, and I could go on and on. So I do want to give you a chance to, uh, to present a little bit about some of the research that you've done. Um, and I think the best way for us to kick that off is with a video. And this is a really cool video. Um, and maybe do you want to set it up and tell us uh, who's in the video? Yeah. So, you know, I, another total random accident. I got an email from the world's top ice climber. I was at a conference um, you know, watching a presentation. This email pops up. It's like from Will Gad, subject Glacier Caves. And it can't be that Will Gad. You know, like won the X Games multiple times and you know, uh, everything else. It turns out it was, and he had gotten really interested in uh, exploring glacier caves and some glaciologists from Canada had given him my information. And he's like, Hey, let's see if we can, you know, figure out like he, he is reaching, you know, the, uh, the end stage of his career. Um, you know, he's, 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 he's getting older and one of the, he's won everything. So what he's been trying to do is use his background in ice climbing as a way of demonstrating climate change impacts to the world. So if you're a winter athlete, you've seen in the last 50 years, massive changes to your sport, ice climbs that don't come in um, anymore, ice climbs that have completely disappeared. And he wanted to try to help use his connections with Red Bull to tell that story. And he wanted to do it in a glacier cave. So he and I got together and came up with this project that I hadn't been able to get funded through traditional science means because Places like the National Science Foundation thought that going inside glacier caves in Greenland was super risky. Um, so Will, uh, Will Gad uh, took the project to Red Bull and uh, they, they liked it. And we got to do this really cool project that was this crazy marriage of uh, like adventure, uh, adventure sports and glacier caving and science. Uh, we actually published a series of research papers off of the results that we got from this expedition. All right. So with that, let's uh, roll the video. And uh, afterwards, uh, you can talk a little bit more about what you've been doing in research. So let's go to the video. I'm Will Gad. I'm a climber, guide, adventurer. I've been to some of the craziest places on Earth and climbed some pretty insane stuff, but this is another level. What a powerful place, eh? Like, Dude, just, whoa. Yeah, I've never been into any place like this, ever. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. This is next level for sure. Nobody has ever dived underneath an ice cap before. I want to get in there and figure out how the water moves through the ice in Greenland. It is loud in there. That is a massive amount of water, thunder like coming up from the inky blackness down below. The moulins are basically the thing that connects the surface melt water to the base of the glacier. And what we're trying to do is understand how those large fluxes of water down into the moulins affects how fast the ice sheet moves, how fast that contributes to the ocean, and then in turn, how fast sea level is gonna rise in the future. down below us. You can see it going for 50, 80 meters straight down below us and it just disappears into this cauldron of slamming water and it, you die for sure down there right now. Typically, you know, we're not working in these when there's that much water flowing into them, mostly because we can't get anywhere. By the time October rolls around, I think everything's going to freeze up real nice. This waterfall is going to shut down and we're going to be able to work our way down all the way to where the water backs up in the system. Yeah, this is looking good. We have potential to do what we want to do, which is go farther under the ice than anybody's ever been and add a few things to the scientific database about how ice works. This is great. And yeah, I'm looking forward to October. This is most people's version of a frozen hell out there. It's minus 30, blowing a hooli, just setting up camp is really difficult. Our starting place is about as wild as it gets, and then we're gonna bump it up several levels after that. There's no like book on how to dive Mulans on top of a Greenland ice cap. Best case scenario, we get there, the ice is stable and good. We can descend a couple hundred meters down into the glacier, and we'll find 
an ice floor down there on top of the water. The, the cave turned out to be totally bigger than we expected. We were expecting a, a vertical shaft or like a crack that dropped straight down the water and was relatively small. Instead, what we found was like this enormous room uh, underneath of the ice sheet. And that turns out to be really important because those enormous rooms can store massive quantities of water that regulate water pressure at the base of the ice sheet. You guys see this crack here? So with glacier caves, there's uh, a lot of dangers that you have to look out for, but um, we definitely didn't expect this cave to be as broken up as it was. There's one really extra scary block that has basically already fallen over, and it's just kind of hanging there. And then behind us, we've got a bunch of cracks, uh, you know, that are basically in alignment with the block that's overhanging. Really short version, that ice is all messed up and we are not stoked. The ice quality was so bad, it really scared me. You know, I'm, I'm around a lot of ice and, and this ice was not good. Anything that falls in climbing is generally bad. When you're stuck down a hole where the only place that ice can go is toward you, it's horrifying. There's a lot of hazard over your head. Any one point could be critical for your survival. If you don't feel nervous at the bottom of a Mulan in Greenland, then you probably ought to get your head examined. When we went in the first time, the floor was pretty flat. When we went back the next time, there were ice blocks everywhere. It was just a big ice breccia that was all frozen together. Clear evidence of a lot more collapse. Bottom line, that was not a safe place to, to, to be. And the only way to make it reasonable is to minimize your time exposure in it. So look it up above us, that's all starting to break down. A lot of adventure and exploration is, is judging the risks and, and making good decisions. And for me, the first goal is always to come back. That's the end of it there. It just goes right to the end, the ceiling comes down right there. And now I think it's an excellent time to leave. It's really disappointing not to get to dive, especially because we saw a site that was going to be so easy to stage from. You could not justify diving in that environment. You might be getting your gear on and then get hit by a two-ton block of ice. And there's just no way to make that worthwhile. One of the things that's really important about exploration is that until you go into these things, you just have absolutely no idea what they look like. You have no idea how they work. This trip was one of the most successful trips of my life. I survived, that's great, but we also learned that the model everyone is using for the Greenland ice cap needs revising. We made a genuine scientific discovery here that has an impact on how people look at melt in Greenland. And I got to use my sports to help do that. We didn't get to dive this time, but we're gonna dive one of these things at some point in time. So I'm not done with this idea. I'm fired up for the future, for sure. I feel like I need to applaud. <laughs> Thanks, that was a great, it was a great trip. And, you know, it was great to be able to highlight something that, um, you know, it doesn't come up so much in science anymore. You know, 200 years ago, all you needed to be a scientist was to get on a boat and sail somewhere that Western people had never been before and write down everything that you saw. And that was science. And, you know, the ability to do that is is shrinking more and more. You can do that in outer space and you can do that in the deep ocean. You know, in both in both places, you need like millions you know, to billions or trillions of dollars. Um, you know, whereas, you know, I'm mean, caving inside the green ice sheet, for example, isn't exactly cheap. Um, you know, but it is still a place where direct exploration has an opportunity to inform science in ways that uh, other techniques just can't. You know, for example, like the only other way that people have seen the inside of the Greenland ice sheet is with geophysical instruments or numerical models. And it's it's kind of like trying to study the human body with an X-ray machine, um, you know, from really far away. Uh, you know, you just kind of get these blobby little images and you're like, well, what does that mean? Right. Because you don't have any context to put it in. And that's what we're able to do with the work that we've been doing. One more question, and then I'll let you you talk without interrupting you. But uh, you said someday we're going to get to to dive. Have you gotten yet the opportunity to dive in one of those? 
We haven't, no, because uh, soon after, we went back the next year uh, and mapped another moulin, uh, and it was a lot more stable, and it looked like a site that would be really good for diving, and then COVID happened. Uh, so, you know, COVID ended up shutting down all of my international field research for two years now. So. All right, I'm going to close my mouth for a while and let you talk and tell us a little bit more about some of your work. All right, awesome. Well, thanks. I'm going to um, pop up a, a screen here and just show and, and share some images that I've shot from some of the work that I've been doing uh, in a bunch of different places. And um, let's see, hopefully this is uh, working out OK, because I can't see. But <clears throat> that caption should drop off in a second. So this is just a picture of Will climbing out of the moulin from from the video. And it, it's a way of showing you know, these kind of unique spaces that we that we get to work inside. And um, you know, one of the reasons that we're working in these is every year on the Greenland ice sheet in the summer, we get massive amounts of melt. We have very, very large meltwater lakes. If you look kind of down in the lower left hand corner of the image, you can see a helicopter shadow for scale. You know, there are massive meltwater lakes. All of this meltwater pours off the surface of the Greenland ice sheet uh, and disappears into moulins, you know, these kind of giant glacier caves. And we know from networks of uh, you know, very accurate global positioning systems that we've installed on the ice sheet, that when that happens, the ice sheet lifts up and it moves forward much, much faster uh, than it does in winter. So in summer, uh, when all of that meltwater is pouring into the ice sheet, we're typically finding that the ice is moving about 400% faster than it is in summer. So a lot of the work that we're doing inside the ice and with these global positioning systems is trying to figure out what's going to happen in the future as the ice sheet melts for longer periods of time uh, and melts more intensively. So uh, we can't go inside the ice. Uh, or we can't go into any of the glacier caves during summer. There's just far too much meltwater uh, pouring into the moulins. So we typically wait until fall, which is actually one of my favorite times to be in the Arctic. Uh, because you get these amazing sunrises that bleed into sunsets. So you're so far north uh, that by the time October rolls around, you can have a two hour sunrise, a couple hours of daylight, and then, you know, a two hour sunset. And uh, this is a, a picture of one of the people on our expedition just kind of ascending right as that sunset's kicking off. The other thing that we get is uh, aurora. Uh, so, you know, at night it's freezing cold, but you can uh, poke your head outside of the tent and see some of the most spectacular uh, displays of, of northern lights. Um, <clears throat> dropping into the caves, uh, like I said, one of the things that we highlighted in that film is that, you know, I have been studying glacier caves around the world for 15 years, and I, it completely blew my mind how big uh, the caves inside the Greenland ice sheet were. I, if someone had told me that they were going to be that big in advance, I would have just told them that they were, you know, flat out exaggerating or lying. Um, you know, so this is just a picture of Will climbing out of you know that one very very large chamber that we repelled into and these chamber sizes tend to be really important uh, features that can go into models that we use for relating how meltwater affects how fast the ice sheet moves these these chamber sizes control you know the volume of water that's stored in the ice and we typically think of them as being very small but uh, no one had ever considered them being this large before and again, we use a lot of, you know, fairly advanced rigging and, and rope techniques to, you know, get in and out of these places. Uh, very, very few portions of these caves are horizontal. We're almost always on rope. Uh, this particular cave had a short section of horizontal passage from where all of the meltwater had backed up into the cave uh, and then frozen like a lid on top of a shaft that continued for at least another 600 meters below our feet that would have been completely full of water. Um, other places that I've worked quite a bit, uh, this is a photo uh, from very close to Everest Base Camp on the Kumbu Glacier. It's uh, Pumari there in the background. And glacier caves play a really important role in controlling how fast glaciers in the Himalaya are melting in response to climate warming. So current projections are that by 2050, uh, the rate of warming has put the Himalayas on track to lose 50% of all of its ice. So 50% of ice loss by 2050 largely as a result of melting that occurs under these caves. The reason that caves are so important is because the glaciers in the Everest region are covered in debris. So if we look at this kind of long feature that's extending from the left uh, over into the right, that's actually a glacier. You know, a lot of people think it's a giant pile of gravel or rocks, and that, that is what exists on the surface. So these glaciers are fed almost entirely by avalanches, which contain almost as much rock and sand as they do uh, actual snow. 
So when the glacier actually starts to melt, all of that debris accumulates on the surface and it should be like a blanket that insulates the underlying ice from melting. You can imagine like taking a giant Yeti cooler and cutting it open and laying it on the surface of a glacier. That's what this debris should be doing. But what we find is that the glaciers that have all of this debris on them are melting just as fast as the glaciers that don't. And part of the reason for that relates to work that Doug Ben, the glaciologist that I went on a rock climbing trip with, uh, had been doing on these lakes that form on the surface of glaciers. So this is a picture of a whole bunch of ponds that are on, on that same glacier from the previous image. Uh, it's the Gajumpa Glacier. It's uh, 17 and a half thousand feet above sea level. This is in winter, so these lakes are starting to freeze over. But in summer, you can see that that water is pretty dark. So it's a whole bunch of suspended sediment. When the sun comes out and blasts all of these ponds with solar radiation, that water will heat up to about eight degrees centigrade, which doesn't sound super warm. You're probably not going to want to go swimming in it, uh, but it can melt a lot of ice. So what it ends up doing is finding little cracks and permeable debris bands, and that warm water starts flowing underneath of all of that debris, and it carves out these elaborate cave systems. So what it's doing is those lakes, by draining, they're actually melting the ice from underneath of those debris layers. And yeah, we get some really big tunnels and some not so big tunnels. So um, again, it turns out that the hardest thing that we have to do when working, you know, between 17 and a half thousand and almost 20,000 feet is crawling. Um, it's very, very hard to catch your breath when you're crawling in some of these places. Um, this is a photo that I always love to show that talks about the different material properties of, of glacier ice. So we think of like ice in a cocktail as being a brittle substance. Um, you know, it cracks or breaks, but um, under lots of pressure, like inside of a glacier, the ice actually moves a little bit like silly putty. So if we look at these crazy curly cues and shapes of these uh, icicles have been warped into, it's because the ceiling is actually being squeezed shut. It's being pushed down by ice pressure and it'll eventually smash into the floor. So um, because it's doing it very, very slowly, these icicles are, are warped and bent into these crazy shapes instead of just snapping. And uh, so I always like to say that like if you're claustrophobic and you feel like the walls are closing in on you, glacier cavings, definitely not for you because they actually are closing in on you. Um, and again, you know, this is um, being able to work in, in the Everest region it, every day is just kind of like a gift. You know, this is a cave system that we map that goes directly underneath the Everest base camp. That peak that's being lit up in the background there by the last rays of sunset is, is Everest. We're not there during the climbing season, which is earlier in the year. But, um, you know, I've talked to a lot of climbers that just had no idea that any of this even existed up there. And they're, you know, they're literally camping on top of it much like a lot of people don't understand uh, or know about a lot of the caves, you know, in Kentucky or Florida or other places. So in addition to the work that I do inside uh, glacier caves, I do quite a, while, quite a lot of work in underwater cave systems, like uh, this cave in the Yucatan. And here we get to access a lot of other super unique environments. Um, so this is another like big vertical shaft in the Yucatan, relatively close to the coast. And everything in this image above the divers is freshwater. Everything below the divers is saltwater. And right where those two waters meet, we have this crazy micro environment where uh, microbes live. There's this unique cloud of bacteria, well, not bacteria, it's a unique cloud, cloud of microbes that are living off of um, gases that are produced from the saltwater that's underneath. So they're bacteria living in the salt water underneath of here that um, have no oxygen. So they eat the sulfate. It produces hydrogen sulfide gas, bubbles up to this layer and those bacteria eat it. So it's an opportunity to explore some of these like crazy um, uh, places that people have never been. I got to work with a lot of robotics teams, uh, people who are developing autonomous underwater robots that will eventually replace us as human explorers. Um, this is a picture of Sunfish. It's an autonomous underwater vehicle that um, can explore uh, independent of uh, human uh, interactions, underwater cave systems and map them and bring those maps back to teams on the surface. When uh, COVID happened uh, and the pandemic shut down all my international research, I started focusing on a lot of environmental stories in Florida, trying to use my combination of photography and science as a way of informing people uh, about problems in our own backyard. 
And this is a picture that I show a lot of a spring that I've been diving in for more than 20 years. And when I first started diving here, um, this water was crystal clear. And like now it's still a nice image, but you know, this is about as clear as it gets and, and the water's pea green. It shouldn't ever uh, be pea green, but this is something that's kind of happening to places around the state. Uh, caves that I used to dive in had crazy amounts of water flow because so much water is being pulled out of the aquifer for agriculture and for uh, human development. Over 900 people a day are moving to Florida and all of them need water. Uh, the flow in these caves is reducing and some of them have stopped flowing entirely. But perhaps one of the biggest problems that we have uh, is nutrient pollution from agricultural fertilizers uh, and uh, septic tanks and sewage, which is fueling uh, these massive blooms of algae that are choking out all of the native grasses inside the spring run. So this is a photograph from West Giles Peacock Spring State Park. It has the last, one of the last stands of eelgrass that's being smothered by algae. Um, so again, once all the eelgrass is gone, things like turtles don't have anything to eat. We had a, if you've been following the news, we had a similar problem over in Indian River Lagoon over the last two years where an explosion of algae from nutrient pollution uh, triggered uh, uh, manatee starvation. So all of the seagrasses in the entire lagoon collapsed. There's like no seagrass anywhere in the lagoon anymore. So when the manatees move into the lagoon in winter, uh, they don't have anything to eat. And uh, this is a photograph of the lower jawbone of a manatee that's covered by the same algae that wiped out the seagrass that they would have ordinarily eaten. And I spent a lot of time, you know, photographing things like, you know, the, the algae covered rib bones of the manatees um and manatees on on shorelines is a way of trying to show people that like look you know this is an animal that we love in florida and this pollution problem that we have is is destroying them and their habitat and you know it was it was super depressing um you know watching you know thousands of manatees die isn't 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 great and i i think that one of the things that it's easy is env environmental scientists and photographers to get fixated on um are the problems uh, so what I wanted to do, though, is also focus on people who were working on solutions. So I live a couple miles from Zoo Tampa. Uh, they have the second largest manatee rescue and rehabilitation facility uh, in the state. And they go out every day and they rescue manatees and they bring them back and they treat them for their illnesses and nurse them back to health and eventually release them. Uh, so, you know, being able to to watch people that are going out there and trying to solve the problem and help address the problem. This is a stopgap measure. It doesn't solve any of the environmental problems, but you know, this manatee here, his mother died, uh, her mother died. Uh, she was rescued. She'll spend two years probably at this facility, um, you know, being nursed and bottle fed until she, you know, reaches adulthood and learns enough about being a manatee from the other manatees that are in captivity um, or, or sorry, in rehabilitation and can eventually be released back into the wild. I also got to meet other people like um, this diver. He's with a company called Sea and Shoreline. He's working as part of a public-private partnership to restore Crystal River. So Crystal River, much like Indian River Lagoon, was a cesspool of, of pollution that wiped out all the visibility uh, in, in, in the estuary and killed all the seagrass. So what the community there did was they're like, well, we actually preferred our environment the way that it used to be. Um, so they fixed a lot of their sewage problems and they started trying to think about how they could fix the environment. So the first thing that they needed to do was remove decades of pollution from the bottom uh, of the estuary. So they came in with a commercial dredging uh, unit and they're vacuuming up in some places 10 feet of organic rich muck so that they can come back and replant the eelgrasses that used to live there. And you see this little cage that the grasses are getting planted under. What that does is it protects the grasses from the manatees who would otherwise come in and eat the grass right after it's replanted. The cages stay on there for the better part of a year. And then the roots are able to grow out from underneath of the cages and cause a whole bunch of other grass to grow. And the roots underneath of the cages get really, really deep so that when the cages are removed, the manatees can come through, they can eat the grass and, um, uh, and, and then the grass will just keep growing back. Much like when you mow your lawn, uh, the grass just kind of keeps growing. And uh, now, uh, you know, Crystal River has a year round population of, of very healthy manatees and these, you know, kind of luxurious uh, seagrass beds. You know, it's an amazing restoration effort that came about as a result of, you know, local and, and state governments working together with uh, scientists and also um, just private citizens to, to fix problems. And, 
you know, it provides a model and a roadmap for fixing a lot of problems that we have in, in other parts of the world. So, you know, for me, you know, because COVID canceled so much of what I was doing in the past, it gave me this kind of new and unique opportunity to try to blend uh, some of my interests in photography and uh, science and, and news and storytelling. And I don't know, I think in, in the future, I'm probably going to be doing um, uh, a lot more of it, even though my, my research is coming back. I, I don't feel like I'm going to stop doing um, any of this type of type of work. So what is the solution then to obviously they said you said they fixed their sewage pollution or problems. Is there a way to save the the other areas that are having the same issue? Yeah, you know, it's tough, right? Because, um, you know, it's going to it's going to require state level intervention. Uh, you know, we can't we're, we're building septic tanks uh, in, in large developments and places um, where septic tanks are just not going to work. Um, you know, they were never designed to work in the type of limestone environment that we have in Florida. Um, so they're big polluters. And then, um, you know, we have a lot of agricultural um, a, a big agricultural industry. So I think at some point the state's going to have to you know, decide, like, do we want to have an agricultural industry or do we want to have you know, healthy springs and watersheds. And, you know, it may be that in order to make both work, you're going to have to scale down, um, you know, the, the scale of the agricultural industry or, or change some of those practices. But those are things that I think are um, a little bit outside of what we can do as individual citizens, um, which is why I think it's important that, uh, you know, science works together um, with, you know, public and private interests to inform government to try to manage all of these different um, you know, competing interests that we have, you know, because ultimately, you know, somebody, you know, my grandfather worked at a dairy farm in Florida. I mean, you know, there are a lot of people whose jobs are tied, you know, to an industry that's doing things that aren't particularly great for the environment. And it would be great to say, like, we should just stop all farms in Florida, but that's not practical. So, you know, to solve the problem, we have to try to get everybody to talk to each other and figure out, like, what the middle ground is going to be. And that's a tough spot. All right, we've got a couple of questions from some of the folks viewing tonight. And the first one is, what can the average person do to help support this type of research or bring more awareness to these type of problems? Yeah, so, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, you know, voting is critically important. Um, you know, trying to pay it, not only showing up and voting, but paying attention to you know, how the politicians that you're voting for feel about, um, you know, issues that you think are important, right? So, you know, it's really easy, it's really easy in this hyper-partisan environment that we live in to get fixated on one or two of a couple of issues, um, you know, but there are so many other things that politicians do and vote on uh, that I think tend to get overlooked. Um, and it's made it really easy in places like Florida um, to, uh, just got a whole bunch of legislation passed that makes it super easy for people to pollute. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, particularly in primaries, um, you know, if, if, if you have a team that you're always going to vote for, um, you know, particularly in primaries, trying to make sure that, you know, that primary field and that you're voting in the primary, um, that those people are, you know, reflecting your interests and in, in preserving, um, you know, the parts of the environment that you think are important. Uh, from the Red Bull video, we had a question. Someone wanted to know just how deep the uh, Mulan was. So how deep was it? <laughs> that was Amber. Um, so I, I, I know Amber from Eastern. Um, oh. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was about 100 meters deep. Yeah, wow. So 300 feet. You know, a lot of people would be lucky to have the opportunity to do the diving and see some of the places that you've done with your diving. And then a lot of people would be lucky to be able to go into the glaciers and to go to Mount Everest and see some. Of, I mean, you are the luckiest guy because you've get to do both. Both of the areas that you've done your research are just fascinating places to go and to see. Thanks. Yeah. And I know I, I actually started out in undergrad as a, um, at Purdue as a, a pre-med major. And, you know, I was from a you know, small town in Ohio, um, Nobody in my family had been to four-year university before. Uh, my next-door neighbors in my apartment were geology graduate students, and they had awesome parties, and they were all coming back from, you know, I remember one guy who was flying around in a helicopter in the Brooks Range in Alaska, like mapping, you know, the um, mapping the mountains, and there was a, 
another person who was coming back from like Kazakhstan and all these different places. And I was like, man, how do you guys afford to do all of this? They're like, oh, well, you know, we're grad students. Like, you know, it's funded through our research. And I was like, I, I what's a grad student? Like I'd never heard of a grad <laughs> student. So it, it was kind of like, I, I started working in a, in a lab at, at Purdue. Um, uh, Daryl Granger was a, a geology professor at Purdue at the time. I think he's still there, um, who studied caves. And uh, kind of slowly pushed me uh, into geology. So I was like, man, I can like go and have all these like awesome, amazing adventures outside. Like I, I'd never considered geology as a career. And you know, one of the things that I've discovered as a professor is that most people don't go to college to become a, a geologist. It's not something that they've ever thought of. It's something that they discover when they take a geology course as an elective. And they're like, wow, this is neat because like in Ohio. Um, you know, geology is a required course for high school, but it was at my school, it was taught by a, a, the, the football coach and he didn't care about geology at all. It was all scratching and licking rocks. And I didn't think it was very interesting. I didn't realize that it was a ticket to see the world. What, uh, as you look and think back at all the places you've been, what would you say is the most amazing place that you've ever visited? Oh man, that's tough. Um, so many different places for so many different reasons. Um, you know, I always get excited whenever we jump on the helicopter and fly out onto the Greenland ice sheet. I always get excited when we get onto the airplane and fly into where we walk into the, into the Everest region. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. So that, that, that probably the most memorable trip I ever made though, was the first expedition that we did uh, to the Everest region to map glacier caves. Like we had no idea what we were doing. We had no idea if we were even going to be successful. And everything that we did was new and exciting. It was like every like not only was it exciting from an exploration standpoint, but the stuff that we were seeing was so different from what people had predicted would be inside glaciers. Like as an example, like people had predicted that all of the caves should be pretty vertical. So we had hundreds of meters of rope, backpacks full of ice screws and everything else. We didn't use them at all. All the caves were horizontal. In fact, the only time that we ended up using the rope was when we got done at the end of the expedition and we partied a little too hard and decided that we needed to use the rope for something and repelled off of our hotel. So, wow. <laughs> and, and I guess the obvious question would be what's next? Is there still a, a goal or a, a thing that you want to do that you haven't been able to do yet? I'd still really like to dive inside the Greenland ice sheet. Um, you know, there's, um, there's some really unique scientific, um, there's really unique scientific observations that we can make. And then also from an exploration standpoint, it's a pretty complicated thing to pull off. So. Well, it's, it's fascinating work. It's uh, beautiful imagery. Um, and, and obviously the work you're doing in Florida right now is, is important and is making a difference. So um, thank you for that. And, and thank you for sharing with us tonight. It's been great. And uh, um, I'm sure we could go on for another hour and hear stories and see pictures. Um, but I know you've, you're, like you said, you're teaching classes now and you're busy. And, um, but we appreciate you being here. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, we look forward to visiting with you again maybe a year from now and seeing what's happening then. Well, thanks so much for having me. I had a great time at Eastern and love to get back on campus at some point. So, Yeah, maybe next year we'll bring you back to campus and you can uh, talk to some of our geology students in person. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd love that. So. All right, Dr. Jason Gully, thank you so much for being with us tonight a guest on the EKU Spotlight series. And a special thanks to all of you folks who have tuned in tonight. We want to remind you again, Scholars Week will be going on uh, again throughout this week and into next week. And you can find out the entire Scholars Week schedule by visiting ekuscholars.eku.edu. And we also want to remind you that uh, EKU Giving Day is coming up on April 13th. We hope that you will uh, join us in celebrating EKU on the 13th and help us reach 2020, 2022 voters for our 2022 Giving Day. That will wrap things up for us tonight here uh, on the Alumni Spotlight Series. Again, thank you to uh, Dr. Jason Gully, our guest tonight. Also, thanks to our folks behind the scenes who are making everything happen, Alex Hannibin, June Kim, and Steve Greenwell. And until we come back with our next Spotlight, thank you for watching and go Big E.